as our prayer into our <coughs> time of illuminating, I thought I would choose a poem. It's a blessing um, by Jan Richardson, and it's called This Grace That Scorches Us a blessing for Pentecost Day. Let us be in the spirit of prayer as we listen to this poem. Here's one thing you must understand about this blessing. It is not for you alone. It is stubborn about this. Do not even try to lay hold of it if you are by yourself, thinking you can carry it on your own. To bear this blessing, you must first take yourself to a place where everyone does not look like you or think like you, a place where they do not believe precisely as you believe, where their thoughts and ideas and gestures are not exact echoes of your own. Bring your sorrow, bring your grief, bring your fear, Bring your weariness, your pain, your disgust at how broken the world is, how fractured, how fragmented by its fighting, its wars, its hunger, its penchant for power, its ceaseless repetition of the history it refuses to rise above. I will not tell you this blessing will fix all of that. But in the place where you have gathered, wait, watch, listen. Lay aside your inability to be surprised, your resistance to what you do not understand. See then whether this blessing turns to flame on your tongue, sets you to speaking what you cannot fathom, or opens your ears to a language beyond your imagining that comes as a knowing in your bones, a clarity in your heart that tells you this is the reason you were made for this ache that finally opens us for this struggle, this grace that scorches us toward one another and into the blazing day. God grant us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change which can be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one for the other. Amen. For many, many years, I attended a monthly prayer gathering with some conservative evangelical pastors in Boulder, Colorado. Now, I was very, very confused and skeptical when I was first invited because that does not describe me. <laughs> but yeah, so we were so totally different in our core values, our theology and how we <coughs> interpreted scripture. But I also was super duper curious, as I often am, so I accepted the invitation. One of those months, Pastor Heather and the evangelicals <laughs> visited the Boulder Sheriff and we prayed for him and his officers. And then another time, we prayed for the executive director of the Boulder Homeless Shelter after hearing about homelessness. And then when I was about eight months pregnant with my first baby, these evangelical men gathered around me and laid hands on me and prayed for me and my family. And I found myself crying, weeping openly, grateful with an open heart that these very different kind of Christians that I thought were so different from me surrounded me with care. And then one November, the leader of the group, Pastor Matt, wondered if we could hold this monthly prayer gathering at my congregational church. That cold, wintry day in November, male pastors of all ages filed into the chapel of First Congregational Church. And we sat in a circle facing each other. And like every month, for many, many years, Matt began with a welcome and explanation of the group's purpose, to gather as Christ's body and to pray for Boulder. And he invited people to share what was going on in their lives and ministries. Usually we pipe up and are eager to share, but this time it was awkwardly silent. 
And then an older pastor that I'd never seen before, and all those many times that I had attended this meeting, he broke the silence. We cannot forget, the man said, the origin of this group was to pray that the souls of Boulder might be saved. The only true way for this to happen is to reject churches like this one who do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the room went silent. A young pastor named Jeff spoke up. Wait, 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 wait. Am I hearing what I think I'm hearing? Tom, are you saying that this church that we're sitting in does not preach the gospel? And are you saying this with one of their pastors in the room with us? Is that what you understand, Pastor Heather? I looked up and said, um, I'm choosing love right now, Jeff. <laughs> Truth is, I wasn't choosing much of anything in that moment. The conversation kind of went dim, and the men were still talking about me like I wasn't in the room. But it was like this muddled sound was muddled by the sound of my heartbeat that was beating in my chest. <coughs> And when Jeff said that one of the church's pastors was in the room, Tom was visibly surprised, probably shocked that it was little old me that he was talking about. It was clear that Tom showed up that day to condemn my progressive church in Boulder. He dared to say that his way of sharing the gospel was the only way. It didn't seem right, and frankly, it didn't seem very Christian. And I felt angry and afraid. I felt like abandoning that whole mission of being Christ's body. And I had no idea what the next right thing was. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were at a prayer meeting too. Jesus had given them specific instructions to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit so that, that they could be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. But why would Jesus think that they could do such a thing? They rarely understood him when they, he, they were in his presence. So how could they spread the gospel to the ends of the earth? They had no idea how to do such a thing yet. However, like most churches, they did know how to attend a meeting. <laughs> you see, on Monday, Thursday, they met in upper room. And on Easter morning, they met behind locked doors. And after the ascension, they met to replace Judas. And then on Pentecost, we find them again meeting. It seems to me that if the disciples were to be Jesus' witnesses, they would have to adjourn all these meetings and actually go out and do a thing. <laughs> but we find them again gathered with 120 others and a wind filled the entire place. Now, this was no gentle island wind. Scripture says it was the sound of a rush of a violent wind, and we know what that, so that, that sounds like, that feels like in Colorado. It's probably terrifying. This confusing, loud sound disrupted their tidy little prayer meeting by blowing in chaos from outside of themselves, outside of their comfort zones, outside of anything that was familiar, and it probably scared them to death. All of a sudden, the disciples were filled with the kind of fire <coughs> that enabled them to speak about God's works in immigrant dialects that they did not know. They didn't know what to do, and then they did. This is so important to emphasize because after I was feeling attacked by a stranger named Tom, <coughs> I was paralyzed in my little prayer meeting, frozen by anger and fear. Maybe you've felt that way too at some points in your life, frozen, terrified, feeling totally ill-equipped. There was nothing in me that could witness to Jesus in that moment. I, I couldn't do or say anything yet. But maybe I needed this little condemnation from a stranger to disrupt my little tidy pr prayer gathering. 
I needed something outside of myself, outside of my comfort zone, outside of anything that's familiar, something that scared me to be able to speak about God's works in a foreign di dialect that the pastors in front of me could understand. I was jolted back into the conversation when I heard a young church p planter say, well, you know, I was a little concerned about what this church preaches too, and so I went on their website and, and I felt this powerful heat rise up in me and I began to speak. Sorry, sorry to in interrupt you, my brother, but I wish you had spent more time with me instead of our website. You see, spending time with me would have cleared up any concerns that you might have had. If you had spent time with me or the other two pastors at this church, you would have found that we don't know how to preach anything else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preaching the good news of Jesus Christ is our duty to the office of ordination to which we were called into by the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, if you are truly interested in saving the lost souls of Boulder, you need our church to exist. People walk into our church broken. Yes, some by the world, but others by the brutal rejection of Christ's church. I could tell you stories about gay people or trans people or divorced people, people with questions and doubts, people with mental illness and disabilities, men, women, young, old, who are cast out by their churches cast out by their churches to wander alone in their faith. It is by God's grace alone that they darkened our door at all. Truth is, we don't, we don't just have a faith. We put people's lives back together in this church through a language of love and acceptance of all people on all walks with God. They would still be wandering if it weren't for this church. And I'm not so arrogant to think that our flavor of Christianity is for everyone. That's why we need each other, fellas. You and I, we belong to each other. We are all a part of a bigger thing. My language about God isn't the only one out there, and neither is yours. Our God is bigger than that. The Holy Spirit is sometimes hard for us to talk about especially in the mainline traditions. We are super skeptical in mainline Christianity about people who are overtaken by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit kind of insults our intellects, right? Holy Spirit moments feel chaotic and out of control and sometimes cult-like. So if we've had an experience of the Holy Spirit, we often keep it a secret or we reason it away. We don't want people to think that we are imagining things, or worse, losing our minds. But in the book of Acts, we read about how the Holy Spirit empowered early Christians to stand up to authorities, to face down mobs, to speak to hostile audiences, and to hold fast through suffering. The Holy Spirit equips the disciples to do things that they were not equipped to do, like comfort the afflicted and confront the comfortable. There was never any boot camp or test cramming that readied the disciples. It was always, always the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit equips you and I too. The Holy Spirit can change our lives, alter our plans, and transform situations. The Holy Spirit makes adjustments to our hearts and minds and actions. You see, shift happens. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the Holy Spirit that makes it happen. She is busy nudging us to do hard things because oftentimes the Holy Spirit reminds us of what's essential, what's most important to us, what is also important to God who created us. Friends, it makes no sense why I spoke to those men on that day in that way. I was more confused than anyone. But I thought of all the people in my church, the ones who had been wounded by churches like theirs, who needed the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit to use my voice in that moment to protect them. I truly believe it was a Holy Spirit moment one minute the words were not in me, and the next minute they were. The Holy Spirit was there, and then she was gone. And she continued to do her work. Because after that meeting, 
Pastor Matt went home ashamed that he did not defend me better. What I didn't know was Matt knew that holding the prayer meeting at First Congregational Church would be a struggle for many of his colleagues. You see, Jeff and Matt actually discussed the challenges it might bring up for their theology and for their reading of scripture. And so Matt thought, well, you know what, the differences would be too vast, and so he decided not to host it in my church. Then a few days later, Matt went to a local theater performance, and he sat down next to an older couple. And after talking to them for a few minutes, he discovered that the woman that he was sitting next to was my boss, <laughs> the senior pastor at First Congregational Church. Matt took this as a sign from God. Yes, the Holy Spirit was nudging him. I'm going to ask her to host the prayer meeting at First Congregational Church. But then the prayer meeting went so south. What did this mean? The night after that awful prayer meeting, Jeff and Matt went over to Tom's house to talk to him. Now, I knew none of this, right? So imagine my surprise when Tom emailed me a few days later after the prayer meeting asking to have lunch with me. Tom and I having lunch? Yes, we did. We discussed mostly theology and the message of Jesus. And I can't say that we left that lunch agreeing on everything, but I can say that we left that lunch with a deep respect for one another. At the end of our conversation, Tom asked for forgiveness, and I was overjoyed to give it to him. Shift happens, and it is the Holy Spirit that makes it happen. It is terrifying. It is chaotic, it is uncomfortable, it is confusing, and it is always holy. That next week, Jeff, Matt, and I went to a bar to drink some holy spirits of our own <laughs> <laughs> and to talk about the world's worst prayer meeting. Matt told me everything that had happened before the meeting and what happened after at Tom's house. And then I talked about what happened at my lunch with Tom I thanked Jeff for coming to my aid that day, and Matt apologized for his silence. And we all lifted a glass to the Holy Spirit, and we laughed about how puzzling it is that she uses all of us for the good work of Christ's church. May it be so in this church as well. Amen. <laughs>